The following is a Simpronto Media production. Leaders. Real life leaders. Hey guys, this episode is from the Grow and Scale Now Summit, where top entrepreneurs and leaders are going to help you take your business to the next level. To get your free ticket, go to growandscalenow.com. Now to the episode. Hey guys, I'm so excited to introduce you to my next guest. And our title today is How to Take a 60 Person Office Completely Virtual. Our guest is Patrick Donahoe, and he's written a book called Heads I Win, Tails You Lose. So, welcome, Patrick. Tell listeners a little bit about yourself. Uh, thanks for having me, Chantel. It's, uh, it's awesome to be on. Uh, you know, I, I was part of the, you know, the 2008, 2009. Uh, crisis where I, I just, you know, graduated, was in uh, a, a business and everything kind of went south. And so I learned some really, really valuable lessons about uh, finance and financial planning, financial advice. Uh, and that's what I that's what I do today. I've done that uh, since 2007. Uh, but it, it humbled me a lot because it showed me how these type of black swan events can come out of nowhere and ultimately impact your business, impact your life. So I learned really, really valuable lessons. And since then, I built a pretty big organization. And the organization has done all of its work over the internet. We have clients in all 50 states uh, and uh, about 15 other countries across the world. And it's been, it's been amazing. At the same time, my organization has been physical. We've been in a physical location. I have a you know 20,000 plus square foot office here that I'm by myself in right now. It's kind of kind of creepy. Plus, we had an earthquake last last week, uh, and I, I was here for I was here for that. That was quite the quite the experience. Uh, and you know, I've always you know I've always wanted to have a more virtual organization. I think that's where the world is is going. Uh, and this was an event that allowed me to uh, take what I've been thinking about for a couple of years and and actually do it because uh, the transition is is you know I, I would say uh, somewhat challenging. Uh, for organizations that are used to being in an office, being together, not having the experience of working from home. Uh, and uh, so it was, a, it was, it was, you know, there were some challenges, there were some hiccups, uh, but over, you know, the course of just a couple of days, we were able to be fully operational. And uh, it's been awesome because we've been able to help a lot of other organizations that are in the, you know, financial world, financial services world, that don't have the capabilities uh, to, to go virtual and don't have the tools don't have the experience. And so it's been, it's been great. My team has definitely stepped up uh, in a big way, obviously with clients, but also with, uh, you know, our, our colleagues across, uh, across this industry. So what were some of the best tools that you had to implement, you know, in order to make it a, tr- a successful transition to going virtual? Well, first it's, it's what we're on right now. It's, you know, zoom, zoom is like, cause I've, I've had a, I've had a podcast since, uh, 2007 and, you know, video and recording. I mean, it was such a nightmare un- until just a couple of years ago when a lot of the technology is made, it made it so easy to have high quality interviews, interactions, recordings, transcriptions, you know, and, and obviously with Zoom, Zoom is partnered with, uh, you know, Ring Central, which is one of the biggest telecom providers in the country uh, and, and one of the biggest in the world. And, and Ring Central, you know, has voice over IP, they have text. So I would say the communication piece is the, is the biggest hurdle, both communication that's uh, uh, among your team among your company, but then interaction with uh, customers, uh, clients. Uh, and, and that's, you know, Ring Central is a big tool that incorporates Zoom, text, and voice over IP, as well as, uh, as, well as chat with, uh, with, your, your, with your team. So that's a, that's a big tool that uh, I think we, we have already had it in place, but it made going virtual almost, see, almost seamless from a communication standpoint. So talk about how... How do you use Ring Central? Obviously, I think most people know how Zoom works, but how do you specifically use Ring Central? Well, Ring Central is just a it's an economical way to have an amazing phone service. So you can do anything from, you know, recording uh, intros, hold times, you can uh, re- do your call tree in, in an incredibly easy way and make modifications to it. Uh, it has a lot of metrics to kind of show you how uh, how often people are on the phone, uh, how much time they're spending with you know each other. Uh, so the the analytics side of it is is compelling as well. Awesome. What other systems besides Zoom and Ring Central would you say that you 
And what do you use for transcriptions? Do you use the transcriptions from Zoom or do you use a different? Yeah, we well, we well, we start with the transcription from Zoom, and then we have somebody go through that and, and make minor minor edits for the for the podcast. Uh, but another big another big piece, and this was this was uh, the uh, president that I have because I'm the CEO, I'm the founder, but I have a, a president who's been in business for a really long time, and the reluctance they had to going uh, to going virtual was uh, culture, right? I believe that if you have an office, right, the 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 health of your culture is is vital or it's very difficult to scale, very difficult to grow. And so that was a big reluctant resistance point for, for my leadership team. But we, a couple of years ago, we were one of the beta groups that pioneered uh, Workplace. Workplace is a, uh, a Facebook instance. So Facebook uh, developed it, but it's essentially your own, your company's own uh, Facebook and you have uh, you have chat, you have video calls, you have you know voice over IP calls, uh, you have groups, you have posting. You can do workplace live. It integrates into Zoom, so you can do Zoom calls and then and then push the live stream to uh, to workplace. And this has been huge because most people are used to using Facebook, so the adoption rate is really high uh, with workplace. And so you. You have anywhere from people posting, uh, you know, memes and and gifts to those that are saying, "Hey, I need some help here. I'm experiencing this," or posting testimonials or posting success stories. It's uh, it's incredible. So, and it's only you know, I think thirty bucks a year uh, per employee. So it's incredibly economical. We we had a bid right before we uh, started testing, doing the beta test about three years ago. Uh, we had a bid. Uh, to to develop our own internal kind of like social cultural intranet, and it was it was north of a million dollars. And when we came across Workplace, it was like a godsend. So it's it's been incredible to help maintain the culture, even though everyone's at home, right? We're still interacting the exact same way. Actually, interaction's gone up a little bit, as you can imagine. And you could there's all the analytics to track it as well. That's great. So what other things have you done for culture? And do you feel like instead of spending money on utilities and the rent and all of that, you've been able to spend more money on culture type items? Yeah. The one thing I discovered, you know, I I did this recently as I was rewriting kind of our our, uh, company vision for the next five years is I went and looked at how many employees we have uh, either hired or have, have departed uh, for various ways. Uh, and it's over o- over 75. And it, it surprised me. But about three years ago, we did a really a kind of a cultural uh, cleansing, in, in a sense, we had just some kind of toxic people here, and redid our entire uh, hiring process. So we became, you know, crystal clear of what our what our values were, uh, what, you know, what work ethic we were looking for. Uh, and we started using a program called top grading. And top grading is an interview style. There's also a software that comes with it. You can just read the book and there's a, a PDF that I think comes with it that allows you to, to understand potential hires uh, so that you're hiring the top 10% okay, of that specific position. And you can integrate everything into most of the hiring systems. We use Workable. Uh, but what we've done is we've tooled, uh, we've, we've tooled the Wonderlick test. Wonderlick test is... Uh, is uh, most known by the NFL using it to uh, help assess a personality, leadership style, values. So we have an automated way in which we you know, bring on people and they have to take the Wonderlick test and fit a certain like range of the test before they even get a, uh, an interview. And so that's been huge is, is instead of trying to transform uh, people that are already here, we found that that is incredibly difficult. <laughs> and so we just found a way, right, of really establishing our values, establishing our culture and setting a, a setting a precedent and then having really good accountability to that precedent. And then when it doesn't work out for people, they don't hit goals. They're not coming to meetings. They're not interacting. It's kind of like they weed themselves out. We've had to you know, fire people and, and let some people go. But it's really finding the right people out there. And here's what's amazing, and this is what I'm really excited for, especially as you know we want to scale. You know, my my uh, you know, we're right in downtown Salt Lake City, and the physical the physical space uh, you know of, uh, of of hiring. There's not many people here. There's a million people, but all of the tech that has come here in the last 
uh, you know, five, six years has really, you know, the unemployment rate here was, was less than 1%. And it became incredibly difficult to find good people. So now that we're going virtual, it opens up this amazing opportunity uh, to find people all across the country that fit your cultural profile, that hold your same values and and can work from and can work from home. I think the whole workforce is going to be revolutionized because of this experience, and it's going to open up the talent pool to man, I mean it, around the world. It's and it's a really it's really exciting. That's awesome. So explain one more time about the Wonderlick test and the top grading. So with the top grading, is that a book or are you talking about top grading software? Both. Yeah, so I'll I'll start with top grading. So top grading, it's a it's like an interview hiring theory is the best way to describe it. Okay. And there's a book, and then there's also a, a software that you can use, and it, it essentially is just a, a question tree. Like some of the questions are are incredible. I mean, an, an example is, you know, what? Tell me about the most challenging time you had be, before you left home, mm. or you know, before you were eighteen. So what it does is, and, it, and it, obviously it's it's tailored to the person that you're interviewing, uh, but at the same time you're able to get into how their life's experiences shaped the person they are today and how they will show up to the work environment. So, and, it, and there are questions not like you know what would your you know former employees tell us about you, you know stuff like that. It's not that kind of very in my in my opinion superficial. Uh, questioning. It's really getting into who the person is, how they show up, their work ethic, uh, their value system. It, I mean, it's, it's incredible. So top grading is the first thing. And the, and the idea behind top grading is to find uh, the the person that's in the top 10% of quality within that uh, specific job position. Got it. Yeah. And then how does Wonderlick tie into that? Yeah. So Wonder, Wonderlick, as I, as I said before, it's a, it's a really old test. Obviously you have like, you know, Myers-Briggs, you have Colby, you have DISC. Uh, one, Wonderlick was one of the first. And Wonderlick is the name of the, of the guy. Uh, but it, it's really, uh, it's used by the NFL to determine uh, the ability to work in a team, okay, as well as the natural cognition, like natural intelligence, not IQ, but like, you know, some the, the natural, and you want to find someone that's smart, that's smart. So, so what it does is it's a, a 50 question test and it creates a range. There's a score system associated with it. So it creates a range and it works within like indeed workable, all the different hiring systems that are, that are out there. And it, uh, it pushes on those that fit a certain range of the of the test without you even having to hire or you know talk to the person. It's all it's fully automatic. So when somebody applies, they'll submit a resume and then they'll take the test. Well, you're not going to get anybody to to show up in your queue to call and hire unless they fit that range. So mm-hmm. you're able to number one, if a person doesn't take the test, it tells something it tells you something about them. When they do take the test. Now it allows you to kind of see where that range is, if they'll fit the culture, if they have leadership capability, uh, if they work well within a team, as well as the, their natural cognition. So it, it, again, it's one of those ways in which you can make the hiring process uh, even better without any manual effort on your part. That's awesome. What other things would you say you've done for culture? Like are most of the people that you have employed with you today? Like talk about that transition. Cause obviously when you first started, all of those people worked for you at your office. Now, what percentage of those people are local where you are? Where'd you say you lived again? Salt Lake, Salt Lake City. Okay, Salt Lake City. So what percentage of those people live in Salt Lake City and what percentage of them are other places? And yeah, so we have how- some, yes, yeah, so we have some contract, we have you know some contract workers that work you know, from all over the place, uh, Florida, Chicago, uh, New York. Plus I have, you know, we have a team of financial advisors. Half of our team works, works remote. So we already had kind of, kind of a remote work, but all of the support was local and they're still, and they're still local. We have one, we have one guy that moved a few years ago to, uh, uh, to Kansas where he's, where he's from and he's still working remote. So we had kind of, we didn't have the entire organization there. Now we have the entire organization there. So we had a kind of one foot out the door, so to speak. 
And so it made it, you know, a little bit easier at the same time, you know, outfitting everyone with the right technology that, that was, that was a challenge. And we had to, we had to scramble because every other company was scrambling to get, you know, laptops and, uh, you know, headsets and, and stuff like that in order to, in order to go home. Cause all their stuff is still here. Like all their computers, you know, monitors, everything is still here. We just outfitted everyone that didn't have the capability to work from home uh, to, to do so. So talk about how, do you ever get together? Like, are you getting together with the people who are locally there yeah. once a week, once a month? Are you having a retreat once a year? So how often are you actually seeing people in person? Yeah. So a couple, a couple of years ago, we, we instituted a, a business rhythm and there's a lot of books out there that tell, that talk about this, but the one that I gravitated the most toward was, uh, was Cameron Harold. So Cameron Harold was the the COO of of some really successful companies, and now he runs the COO Alliance. Yeah, he also has the Second in Command podcast. I'm not sure if you've heard of him before. Yeah, Amazing. I'm good friends with him. I know Cameron very. Oh, well. okay, okay, yeah. So I, I know Cameron really well too. He yeah, he's been on the podcast a bunch, and yeah. So he's. Th- those books are are amazing, and so we adopted a lot of the meeting rhythms of Double Double, which was probably his his, his uh, first really big book, and and in there we have you know you have a line you have a weekly alignment meeting with departments, you have a, a daily huddle or kickoff. So we've tried to maintain all of that. Okay, weekly one on ones, weekly alignment, and then our and our daily kickoffs. But we're doing it all through all through Zoom, right? So you have you know ton, a ton of people with their cameras on. And, you know, sometimes, you know, people don't have the greatest internet. So we've had to work with that. But anyway, it's really cool because we're able to maintain, right, our, our meeting rhythms, even though, you know, we're, we're working remote. Mm. So, okay. So you've got a weekly one, you've got a weekly one-on-one, you have a daily huddle. How long is that daily huddle go? Seven, seven. Well, when we do it here, it's seven minutes, right? It's basically a short message from me. Then uh, we do... Uh, a shout out. We open up for anyone that wants to shout each other out, giving each other high fives, kudos. Uh, then we do a, a score, a, a quick scoreboard, and then every day each department has uh, a, a, an assigned day where they give an inspirational message, and then we do a cheer. And yeah, it's been interesting. <laughs> we tried to sing happy birthday to someone yesterday, and that didn't work out very well uh, at all. But anyway, it's what it's one of the, yeah. It, the the huddles should be really short. We've made them a little bit longer, just given you know, the circumstances, allowing people to, to talk about what's going on, what are some of their challenges, uh, what they, what they need help with. So they've lasted about 30 minutes, uh, over the last week and a half. Um, but we're going to get back to kind of the seven to to 10 minute range. And then weekly alignment is, uh, is usually with departments, right? So we have a, a really, uh, detailed scoreboard, so I think every every business has the same steps of a business process, right? You have leads coming in, uh, then you have uh, quality conversations, then you have uh, uh, sales, then you have fulfillment, then you have customer service. So and you can measure all of those. And so we've kind of taken that full funnel and we we measure it daily, and then we set all of our uh, goals on a four month cycle. And then we have bonuses and, and financial incentives because of that. So we have, we have that scoreboard every single day. And so when we do weekly, weekly alignment, it's what did you do last week? Where were things off? What did you not anticipate? Okay, let's set some goals for this week. So it's like a kind of a, a, a goal setting and review, right? So it's what are we going to do this week that is going to get us closer to those goals? So that's weekly alignment. And then weekly one-on-ones are just, you know, department head to – uh, their, their, uh, their employees. So that's our, that's, we make it a really simple rhythm. It all starts with like a, uh, an offsite or a retreat where you establish what you want to do for the cycle. Right. And then, then it kind of, you know, cascades into, you know, the daily scoreboard and then all the, all the different meeting rhythms. So it's, it's awesome. I mean, he's a, he's a, I think he's a genius. He doesn't tell call himself a genius, but I think he's made it so simple to institute, right? A, a really workable, successful meeting rhythm. Yeah. He's a great speaker too. We've had, I've had him down a couple of times. Oh, have you really been um, person? Well, cool. for e, for, I was at EO, you know, oh, okay, and yeah, different yeah. Vistage meetings and they yeah, brought him yeah. down for different, he's an amazing speaker as well. Um, well, let's talk about one of the things that people fear. I would say if you ask, you know, a hundred people and they, they are in a regular brick and mortar, they're saying, 
their biggest fear would be that people are just not going to get as much stuff done. Like they're going to be doing laundry. They're going out to a two hour lunch with friends. So what other systems have you put in place to make sure that people are really getting after the goal and they're actually getting work done? That's a great, it's a great point. And I would, I would say that's the natural concern of everyone, right? Especially uh, management or leadership. And that's where you, uh, it's, me- it's measurement, right? You, wh- whatever is measured gets managed. I mean, that's, it's that whole, that whole saying, uh, and whatever is managed improves. And then we, we add another layer onto it is incentivizing uh, the end result that we, that we want. So what it does, and we have team, we have team incentives, and then we have individual incentives, so when somebody goes and does laundry or, uh, you know, doesn't, uh, you know, goes out with friends or goes on a walk or, or watches Netflix, that, that will show up in their, in their measurements. And, and that's where it's like, well, you have to give them fr- uh, freedom and you, you measure. And that's all that really matters to me in, in the end, right? Is they're getting what needs to be done, done. Uh, and if they want to, you know, watch a movie or if they want to go do, I'm like, okay, that's good to have those breaks. And if you want to do that, awesome. Okay. At the same time, these are, these are our expectations. And, and that's, again, I'm going to the scorecard and measurements. I, I found that for, for me is the easiest way to, to uh, have accountability. And, and I believe that's uh, also empowers the right person, right? Again, bring on the right person. One of the, one of the qualities we want out of a, a team member is that they they love being successful they love growing okay they love challenge and when you put a number in front of them and you incentivize them for that like it's it's kind of natural for a person to get to get it done and if they can get it done in six hours awesome they can get it done in four hours awesome that that helps us you know determine okay let's set the goal a little bit higher next next time at the same time i think virtual doing virtual work without good accountability is going to be is going to be difficult. Hey guys, I want to take a minute real quick to tell you about this retreat that I'm putting together. It's going to be just 10 lucky people that I'm going to select and we are going to stay in a five-star resort in Miami and it's going to be pamper time, but the most important thing, I'm going to open up my books. I'm going to show you everything. You're going to leave there with my Word docs. You're going to leave with a USB drive with all the information that I've possibly done. Every system in place. A lot of times you go to these conferences, you know, you get all jazzed up, but you don't walk away with anything. You're going to walk away with this retreat with tons of systems. Go to ChantelRay.com slash retreat to learn more. Mm, Yeah. And now that you know, our country is seeing this pandemic with COVID-19. I think that a lot of people are saying, man, I wish we would have put things in place to go virtually and have every process that we need to go virtually. Any tips for people of how they can easily transition, you know, where they go, okay, I'm, I'm here right now. I'm completely brick and mortar. Everyone comes in. Now I want to kind of put my foot in the water, put my knee in the water. I'm not ready to jump all the way in. What are some ways that they can easily transition and then tips to go all the way in? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start by saying, by saying this. So I, I was at a, I was at a conference a couple months ago and one of the speakers was uh, the, the former CEO of Blackwater. So Blackwater is like that private military uh, contracting group. And he sold, you know, a couple of years ago for like a couple billion dollars and now is a venture capitalist around around the world. And he talked about COVID-19 before it was even called COVID-19. Well, I think actually it was called COVID-19 by then, but it was before anything hit the U.S. And he talked about the disruption in China and how uh, integrated China is into the uh, global supply chain, meaning all of the, you know, the stuff that we're using now, plast- uh, plastics, uh, medicines, chemicals. Like over 60% of everything that we uh, use and consume has, China has a role in that process. And he said that there's going to be a lot of disruption to business and it's going to take a couple months to manifest. So I believe what we're seeing right now, I mean, think about it. It's like, how much chaos have we seen in just 10 days? Now we're doing like (laughs) multi-trillion dollar like bailouts in 10 days or 11 days. It's like, I think the 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 workforce was ill prepared for this, and these are the, these are the situations that help us learn mm. uh, if we if we put the the right context around it. 
And I, right now for me, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited because there are a lot of businesses that weren't prepared for this and really aren't going out there trying to figure out how to make their business work in a different way. And I think this presents a huge opportunity for, for entrepreneurs because the talent pool, as I mentioned before, is, is greatly expanding. And, and so I think the tools are out there. The education is out there. You know, uh, Mitch Russo, I don't know if you know Mitch Russo. He wrote The Invisible Organization. Uh, he is the, kind of the consultant that helped Tony Robbins' entire organization go virtual a few, uh, few years ago. So he wrote The Invisible Organization, Mitch Russo, uh, Jason Fried, and I can't remember the other guy's name. They wrote a couple books. One of them is called Remote. Uh, there's books out there. There are courses out there. You just got to look for them. Find those that have actually done it, right, that uh, talk about it and give guidance there. You don't have to pay a consultant, right? They, just follow the, follow the handbook. And, and I think it's even easier uh, right now. Uh, and I also believe that this, uh, this experience is emotionally impacting people where, you know, they, uh, they want employment, they want work, but now they're realizing that, wow, I can work from home and be valuable, which means that I can work for anybody that has virtual work. And I actually did a, a study, I had a, just one of my side projects, uh, I had a, a freelancer find uh, all of the virtual work uh, in the country that pays more than $70,000 a year. And, and she found like o- almost a thousand uh, different positions. So right now it's like, I think this is just going to accelerate the opportunity to work virtually. And it, and it's, and, and it's exciting at the same time. I look at this as, you know, just it's one thing that's going to push us closer to having a, a, a more optimized workforce but I believe that there are some things coming in the future, right, in the next probably three or four months where it's going to present even more opportunities for those that are equipped to, to actually get a customer online, talk to them online, service them online, fulfill online, and have their workforce scattered throughout the entire country doing it. I mean, the, it, the time and the experience is perfect, and, and I believe that if people – really plug in and work hard and figure this virtual thing out are going to crush it. Mm, I love that. So is there any other technology that you love for making sure people are getting their goals and actually achieving what you want them to do? Is there any technology that you have for that? Um, one, one just came to mind. It's something that we, we instituted uh, maybe a year, a year ago, but it's Podium. So okay. Podium is is partly funded by uh, Google Google Ventures, and what it is it's a it's a review system. Uh, I think right now the a company's quality is is determined by their by their presence online, right? And having good reviews, whether it's Facebook reviews, Google reviews, Yelp reviews, it will either make your business thrive or, or kill it. And I was talking to a, a, a CEO that I know well of like a, you know, $50 billion company in revenue per, per year. And, and I, I challenged him a bit. I'm not going to obviously say who it is, but, I, but he said that I'm not going to gain the system to get good reviews. And I was like, Scott, like, you think the only way to get good reviews is to game the system? And, it, and obviously there are ways to, to do that, but I think Google cuts down on, you know, they, they figure out ways to, to mitigate that as well as Yelp. Uh, but Podium, what it does is it allows you as like a leader, business owner, executive to, to see the value that your company and organization is bringing to people. Uh, and it allows you to incentivize, it allows you to, uh, you know, learn where you're deficient, where there are opportunities. So I think Podium, and it's really reasonably priced. Uh, but Podium is is crushing it. I think something along those lines, oh man, I, I don't use this, but I have a good buddy who's an incredible marketer that told me about it. It's a uh, video peel, video peel. Do you know what that is? Mm-mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a way to do the same thing, get good reviews, but you, uh, it's video. So you send like a, a video link out to someone and, or a, li- a link and they can record their own video testimonial of your organization. So video peel is another one. I think right now, the customer is who is going to determine uh, whether a company survives or not. I think mean, now more than ever, that's going to happen. Absolutely. But I think that's a tool to definitely pay attention to, regardless if you're a $50 billion organization or if you're a $10 million organization or if you're a, you know, half a million dollar organization, like 
the cust you know the customer is ruling the roost right now, and whoever wins the heart and mind of the customer is going to is going to be successful going forward. I love that. That's just my that's just my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Let's talk about pay structure for a second, and I will give you an example that a guy told me that he has a virtual company, and he says what he does is his pay is based on. He, he gives people a base salary of 33% of whatever their job is worth. So for example, if it was $100,000, right, they'd get about $33,000 as a base salary. Then if they're hitting their goals and they're just doing an okay job, like they're not crushing it, they get another third, they have a bonus one that's 33% of their salary. And then it's like, if they are really knocking it out of the park, they are crushing it, they're getting their bonus too. So now they're getting that full amount, but because they're virtual, he wants it to be very, you know, did you hit this goal? Did you hit this? Did you hit that? Can you give any examples of pay structure or, you know, incentives that you've done very specific that you can come up with to share with people to go, okay, well, you're going to still, as long as you're getting everything done, you're still making this amount of money, but we're going to have to shift you just a little bit so that, we're making sure you're still hitting your goals while you're at home. Okay. I'm going to approach this a little bit different because this is a great, a great question. And I have made so many mistakes here uh, because you, you, I tend, and maybe you, you've done this in the past, but I, I would always assume people were incentivized by what I was incentivized by. Mm, so true. Right. And, and that got me in a lot of, a lot of trouble. So I'll give you an example. So this last uh, this last December, we had our, kind of our Christmas party. But uh, last year, actually it's over a year ago, we developed an employee advisory board, right? Mm-hmm. Who are the ones that organized activities, you know, for Christmas bonuses. For They're the ones that kind of gathered feedback from the rest of the group, right? The rest of the team and then told us what people wanted. And we had, we had spent, you know, $20,000, $30,000 on, on Christmas stuff in the past. And... And all they wanted was to go see the new Star Wars movie. So we booked out a theater, we got popcorn and Chick Fil A, and it was like eight thousand bucks. And every, it was the I have not I've had I had people crying, you know, the, the next morning of how grateful they were for that experience. So it it shows you that uh, sometimes what you think people want is not what they want. So mm-hmm. what, the first place I've started when it comes to incentives and compensation is to look at the market value of the position. So these days you have like salary.com, payscale.com, and they're very reasonably priced. If you have a, a, an HR or a PEO that you're using, um, they, they probably have login and access to all of that. So you can find the range of pay and all of the, all of the reports for those positions have both uh, base pay and then incentive compensation. I wouldn't try to, to start uh, – before that, like, don't use your intuition. This is just me. I'm, you guys can, can or the audience can do whatever, whatever they want, but I start there. I look at what the market value is of that position and what the market pays from an incentive standpoint. And that's where I start. Okay. Then mm-hmm. some positions like seriously, if you have, if you have some, you know, customer service positions, they're not incentivized by money. It does it, there may be some incentive there. They're more incentivized by benefits, right? They're more incentivized by having their healthcare paid, right? And and I it blew, it blew me away. I'm like, if you make more money, you can afford the healthcare. Like, why would you want to just make more money? And people, people, a lot of people don't have that as an incentive. So you got to, for the different positions, you got to figure out what incentivizes that position. It could be bonus. It could be commission, right? It could be huge upside, unlimited upside. But for some, that would, it it freaks them out. Okay. So that's where I, you know, I've, I've settled on, you know, using pay scale reports to do all of my, all of my compensation uh, and incentives. Right. And then your fun and the financial model uh, uses, uses that. And, uh, and I look at really profit as the means to pay bonus, Uh, not necessarily just because a person does, you know, the job they're, they're already paid for. Right. That's another thing that got me in, in trouble is I would pay bonuses when the bonuses weren't earned. Right. So you have to have like, OK, where does where does compensation end and bonus begin? Right. Mm-hmm. And then you have metrics. Right. That do what keeps the company healthy. And then you have metrics above and beyond that. Right. For for bonus. Right. And the metrics, I think, is it relates to the positions. You got to be very cautious there. But what I found valuable 
is team is team accountability where mm-hmm. you have individual incentives and then you have group incentives. Yes. Right? And then you have leadership incentives on top of that. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. I have a great story for that. This is my funny story that I use for team accountability. So there's this place that's like an exercise workout place that they have here. And it's all these women and they get together and they did some kind of team accountability. So that said like, if you know, they put the A team, B team, C team, and they said, if you come every day for the next seven days, whatever team, they get this free t-shirt. And so I was talking to one of my friends and we were going to have this like big get together at lunch and everyone loves doing this. We do it once a quarter with all my girlfriends. And I said, are you going to be there? And she's like, no, I can't. I'm like, why? She's like, we have this team accountability thing at this workout place. She's like, I cannot let the rest of the people down. Now, if it was just a one-on-one, there's no way she would miss this really fun event that we do once a quarter for a t-shirt. She was like, my friends would absolutely kill me if I didn't attend this workout event. And I was thinking that is literally the power of team accountability. They are, they're going to win a t-shirt and she's missing this great event. And I, I like to tell that story because it's so silly, but it's so true. Well, people are, we're very emotional creatures, right? And we, we're, we're compelled by a, f- a few things, but rarely do we make profound uh, uh, conscious decisions. And so you really just got to look at, okay, what are, the, what are the emotional reasons, right? A person would go above and beyond. Uh, and it really depends on on the uh, the person. And I believe that you you know through the different positions, uh, you know whether it's a, a leadership position, whether it's customer service position, a sales position, okay, uh, an assistant or support type of position, right? You can you can figure out the common things that motivate a person person emotionally, right? But we you know we found that doing you know a little bit more PTO is like. It, way more successful than just paying cash and you actually can pay less right depending on the position so for me you know i would i second guess my intuition when it comes to uh management and leadership right because i'm i'm naturally like the entrepreneurial type or i'm always like looking for what's next i'm looking for the opportunities right i'm pushing the limits but that's not how most people think and and when i when i realized that like the whole game changed and that's where I, you know, brought on, you know, I brought on some gray hair people, right, that, you know, had experience, that uh, knew how to run teams, knew how uh, the financial side of things works, and it made a, a massive difference. But, you know, the guy I brought on, you know, pr- should probably cost me half a million bucks a year. But because I give him uh, four weeks of vacation a year, right, like he's working for way less than, than that, plus in, in incentives. All right, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say one thing, and I didn't plan on saying this, Chantel, but I I believe that this is the future of of work. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a have you ever heard of the company Carta? Is that name? Uh-uh, I haven't. So I've Carta, heard of it, but I don't remember what it is. Yeah, so Carta is, and I, the reason why I know so much about them is that my my next door neighbor that I've become really good friends with uh, was one of the founding uh, software developers for them. So Carta is it's a platform that manages company equity for employees, hmm. right? So, and it, it, it started, well, it's in Silicon Valley. I mean, they have some offices here in Salt Lake and, and, and elsewhere, um, but it, it's a platform, right? They, for a, an ESOP, employee stock, op, uh, stock ownership plan, which is part of compensation for most tech companies, right? They get paid in salary bonus, but also they get paid in, in stock or grants or options, and, and so Carta is the one that pioneered that and they're the biggest platform by far. And they just bought a private stock exchange and mm-hmm. are developing Carta X, which is you can you know exchange private stock of companies. Anyway, it's, it's fascinating. But what I'm trying to say is that the CEO, Henry Ward, has this philosophy when it comes to the future of work. And he uses it based on the, the uh, work in the past. So we started as like human beings started as like the indentured, ser- you know, indentured servants, then then slavery, uh, then working uh, for, uh, you know, exchanging time for money. Uh, now he believes that the future is employers are going to be owners, right? Meaning that part of their pay is going to be ownership. And so an ESOP is something that's been, you know, an employee stock ownership plan is something that has been around for a really long time, but the most recent tax legislation has made it easier 
uh, and more lucrative for the company from a tax perspective uh, to use this as part of their compensation plan. And it's easier to do now because of how tech, uh, technology administers it. And so, for instance, it's like if you if you and this is my belief and this is what I'm instituting right now with my company. Uh, but if you want to scale, th- there has to be ups. There ha- the people that are going to help scale are going to want upside and they're, the incentive of upside. It, they may not have vesting. The vesting may be 10 years in the future. Right. But because they have skin in the game and they're part of it, like, yeah, the, the attitude is a, is a game changer. Right. Mm-hmm. So I so I believe that's another part of the future of work that most people are not talking about. And today it's a lot easier. I mean, Carta has a bunch of education. They have a bunch of YouTube uh, videos as well. Uh, and then I think they have some ESOP uh, resources. At the same time, it's like I, I, I believe that's the few, that's what I'm looking at for the next like five years as far as what will triple my company isn't like, you know, how things are going virtual, uh, how, you know, I can improve my marketing. I can improve sales. It's essentially that that is what I believe is the the big the catalyst that's going to make the biggest difference in in my growth. Yeah, well, it's funny because um, I love that, and I agree with you. I feel like we always, as entrepreneurs, are like, "This is what I think you want," and we think everyone wants it. But I just actually one of the things we do every week is we have everyone come up with three items that they are planning on doing for that week. Like no matter what else happens, here's my three commitments. They write them on the board. We have it on a, we have it on a computer and it pulls up and we actually measure how many times someone is able to hit their goals. Cause what we say is every week you shouldn't be hitting your goals. I have a, a guy that's a tennis coach and I asked him how his daughter was doing. And I said, how, how's she doing? She's like, he said, she's doing terrible because I put her in a level that was too high and she kept losing and losing. And then her self-esteem got bad. And then when I put her in a level that she was supposed to, then it was bad. He said, you should be achieving your goals two out of every three. He's like, if you're playing tennis and every week you're winning every game, you're not in the right level. You need to move up. Right. And then the next thing is he said, but two out of three is perfect. That gives you enough self-esteem. And so what we say is that each month you should be hitting your goal. Like this week, maybe you're hitting three out of three next week. You're hitting three out of three, but maybe next week you're only hitting two out of three. And then maybe one out of three to see if you're stretching yourself. And I did a team accountability thing where we said, okay, if everyone hits their goals this week, we're going to do like a happy hour on Friday. And we did that for a couple of weeks and it was the wildest thing for three weeks in a row, no one hit their goals. So I think what I'm going to try is saying, okay, what do you guys want? Because obviously they didn't care about the happy hour that we were going to do. I need to go back and say, all right, let's come up with something you really want. And now let's see if you hit your goals. What do you think about that? No, that's amazing. And that's where, and that's my go-to is, and I think it's for customers as well, right? Is you want to give customers what they want, not what you think they want. And, and I think that the number one customer you could ever have is a, a raving fan employee, right? Mm-hmm. And if you discover, and Cameron Harold is amazing at this, right? It's finding what people want, whether it's tickets to a game, tickets to a movie, uh, you know, their healthcare paid for, uh, more, t- more time off, right? A Friday off or a Friday work from home. Like you, get, they're the ones that are going to tell you that. And usually it's going to cost way less than, uh, than what you would have come up with. <laughs> Exactly. Well, this has been amazing. Any other last minute tips that you say, you know, I wish I would have done this differently when I transitioned from going to brick and mortar into virtual, or, you know, I wish that I would have done this differently. Any things you can think of? Yeah, for sure. And this is more, this is more, this is more me. Uh, But I, uh, the more I learned about myself and my strengths, the more I was able to appreciate the, the, the strengths and talents of others. And, and I believe there's so many tests out there. Uh, I think Myers-Briggs is a, is a great one. Colby is a, is a great one, the Colby A index, where you can discover your strengths and, and position yourself to do what you should be doing. And then you bring on others that complement you. Uh, and I brought on you know, a president a couple of years ago, and it, it was a game changer. Is a game changer because he had experience. He understood how to measure this, how to lead in a different way. And, and what I discovered is when I would uh, 
uh, challenge or or try to influence uh, an indiv- an individual, an individual employee, it was like the biggest backfire in, in the world, right? Because it came from me, it came from leadership. But when it comes from you know management, when it comes from uh, you know th- their direct report or th- who they uh, directly report to. It, it makes a, a massive difference. And so it's figuring out, you know, w- the communication style and the communication sequence. And that's where I had to bite my, t- I, I bite my tongue, tongue a lot. And I have three people, right. Uh, that are, are my goats are my, that, that directly report to me. And that's all that I speak to all that I talk about, all that I, I influence. I, I do positive messages from, you know, the, 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 the team standpoint. So especially with our, our daily, you know, our daily huddles, but aside from that, that's where I rely on leadership. So I, I believe for me, if I were to do anything different, it was to discover more about myself initially uh, and then bring on those individual uh, leaders, managers that complimented me. I love it. Well, I'm so excited to read your book, Heads I Win, Tails You Lose. Tell listeners a little bit about that book and tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Sure. Well, this is... It's really, it's really odd, right? Because I wrote the, I wrote the book, you know, 2017, it came out in 2018. Uh, but what I tried to do in there is talk about how the, the way in which financial planning tells people they can retire is not realistic. And so what I tried to, to do in that book is, and this is what's crazy about the current environment is there's a way in which you can achieve a degree of financial independence, but work for the rest of your life. And that's why I started to do these studies about, okay, what type of virtual positions, uh, freelance jobs, consulting jobs that you can learn about right now. And it may take you 10 years to be of quality and of experience to be successful there. But how I look at human nature is people, people seek meaning, right? And meaning comes from them working and making a difference and getting the remuneration from it. Okay. If you stop doing that, people, people uh, die inside. Okay. When all you're doing is consuming and taking, there's a, there's a side of hum, the human being that needs to be producing and, and providing value. There is a, an energy of meaning that comes from that, that I don't think is, is, uh, is, is replaceable. So mm-hmm. when I look at, you know, the, the whole re- retirement industry with my industry, right, that's where I, I realized, wow, we have it all wrong. And we're leading people to a place that is not going to work. And that's where, like I said, in the book, I I have this kind of formula where you can discover, right, something that you love to do, something that brings you a lot of meaning that you can get paid for and do that for the rest of your life and mix in a lifestyle right now, right, or as soon as possible. So you're working 20 hours a week, but you're playing golf, you're going on vacation, you can work remote so you can do some work, even though you're on vacation. So it's to create a mix of life, not these like silos, like here's my silo of time for work. Here's my silo of time for vacation. Here's my silo of time for recreation activities. I think you can mix in things and that's what financial independence is. So the book really lays out some strategies that you can uh, take into consideration to get to that point in your life, as opposed to waiting until you're 65 and, you know, probably not physically uh, capable of enjoying the things that you think you would enjoy at that point. Hope you enjoyed this episode from the Grow and Scale Now Summit. Again, you can get your free ticket now at growandscalenow.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Real Life Leadership. If you'd like to get the show notes or access more resources, log on to reallifeleaders.com slash podcast to get the show notes from this episode and any other resources we might have mentioned. And also, we'd love to hear from you. Be sure to review or rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. And if you have any leadership questions you want answered, email podcast at reallifeleaders.com. 